an array of um, former candidates, uh, many of whom have served in public office in Massachusetts at various levels. And uh, I'm going to ask them a few questions, uh, open-ended questions that they haven't really prepared, but uh, like I didn't even know they were going to sit in this chair until 20 seconds ago, which is really quite beautiful. Uh, so, my first question, I'm going to ask each of you to take the microphone in turn and just spend a couple of minutes. Tell us your name. Tell us the first office that you ran for. And what was your state of mind when you did that? What were you thinking? What prompted you to go from being an ordinary person living in our society to a person who said, I could run for a public office. Got the cue? Tell us who you are, what you ran for, and what were you thinking that first time you tried to run for public office? Um, hi, I'm Gus Steves. Um, I am currently a town councilor in Southbridge for another month and a half or so. I actually ran originally several back in, I originally ran in 2014. Um, although I had been on a couple of town, appointed town boards for a couple of years before that. Um, but as a reporter, I had seen what our town was doing, I had seen how the town government was functioning, and quite honestly, I looked at it and went, I can do this. Um, and I figured that almost anybody really can, the only, the only catch to running for office is doing a little homework in advance, getting an idea of how the system functions, and seeing that you can fit into the way our local democracies work. Um, guys, I think the real catch is that a lot of people um, in our society do not hear a lot about uh, how local democracy functions. Because our, our educational system really has got to be pretty bad when it comes to civics. Uh, and the, uh, so it basically has become almost, almost an old boys network. Um, and at the local levels, it's still really easy to get involved because all you really need to know is talk to them. Really need to do is talk to them. To be quite honest, I mean, granted, it's a little bit different at a town the size of Southbridge, which is about seventeen thousand, versus say a Holyoke or one of the bigger cities, which is definitely much more challenging because you have to get a lot more people. Um, but really, if you're willing to do a little homework and walk and talk to people you'll get elected. It doesn't really cost that much. It really doesn't. And quite frankly, I tried to avoid raising any money because I think it's corrupt. Um, and I'm in the end of my third term. What can I say? <laughs> Thank you, Gus, for serving. Um, and serving your, your town consistently. Um, my name is Charlene DeCalagero. I'm from Berlin, Mass., which is here in central Massachusetts. And um, my thinking process was, took years. Um, partly it was because I saw that we didn't have a whole lot of terribly good candidates out there. And by we, I mean our country, our state, you know, who even knew about the local stuff. Um, so I started talking to friends about it and I thought about the level that I think most Americans think about when they think about politics, which is the national level. And I was like, well, I'm in my, I think, 40s or 50s at the point that I really started thinking about this. And it's like, well, I don't have a lot of time Therefore, I should run for Congress and really try and make a difference. Um, thankfully, I didn't do that. <laughs> Not that there aren't people who absolutely should do that, but I think the really one of the key questions I had, and I think a lot of people had, is what, what could I do in a given office? How could I improve? our lives and the world and what would I be good at and um, 
Massachusetts, the state level, does have a training program called the Citizens Legislative Seminar, and one of our chapter members at the time, Brian Moss, had gone to that. He said, you absolutely have to go to this. And I attended in the fall of 2015. And my background, my professional background, um, engaged education and educational policy at, at every level. But the state is critical in terms of public education. And what I got out of going to that seminar was, well, I may not, I probably already knew that education is one of the, you know, largest budget pieces in the state budget. And, um, and I went to this seminar and a bunch of state senators talked to us and they said, you didn't have to be an attorney. I was like, good, because I'm not one. And, um, and I discovered that they were mere mortals. Um, and not any smarter than anybody in this room. So, um, I think part of deciding to run for office is what's your skills, your knowledge, your experience, and matching that up with the office. So I started running for public office in 2016. Not a year that people really notice much of politics. Not a hard thing to do. Um, I didn't win that first race, but it was a two-way race between me and the 20-plus year incumbent who a lot of people had no idea who he was. Um, and so I'm really going to put in a plug here. Yes, I think the local, the local level is a great place to run for office and really make a difference. And so subsequent to that race, I ran less than a year later and won for library trustee. And I was active. I was active uh, advocating at the state level, and I think that was critical to the unheard of um, budget we, the libraries in this state are way, way, way underfunded, shock. Um, but with a bunch of us went in without even like discussing it beforehand to plan and said, you know, us library people, we've been too polite for too long. So we got a boost to a line we didn't even ask for. So. When people get pissed off and when you are a local official, you can start to make a dent in the state level. So, um, but the state level, I really strongly encourage people, particularly with um, experience in education, social services, healthcare, um, those are three huge budget items, housing, huge budget item we said would really make a difference to lots of folks in our community, the people who've been historically and consistently underrepresented in Massachusetts. And any, any issue that you care about, what we need is a green, literally just one, to win the state rep seat in, in Massachusetts to stand up for a little thing called democracy. Massachusetts state legislators hide their votes legally. People can't believe this when I tell it to them, but they, they hide their votes. And so all we need is one person and one Green Rainbow person to get elected and, and stand up when they vote on their rules and say, this is unconscionable. <laughs> and I think we can win. Thank you.
Thank you. That's hard to follow. I highly respect librarians and educators, and thank you for your service. And I think that the uh, military should be forced to have bake sales for their funding. And librarians in school should get the money that the military gets. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael Lavery. Good morning. It's my first uh, in-person convention. Um, I started running for office in 2016 as well. So I think it was a, a spur from Bernie's campaign. Uh, he asked us all to run locally and not be afraid. So I took that uh, torch and ran with it. I ran for the local select board against a third generation townie whose mom was the town clerk previously and his dad was in the highway department. So it was unheard of that an outsider, quote unquote, would be someone like that. But it was uh, it was by mandate because I beat him by 25 percentage points. So. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I had some things on my side. I was an organizer for many years and an activist. I helped uh, do digital marketing and phone banking. More uh, Healy, our current governor, at one point called me personally after a, a phone banking session on election day and, and thanked me for making the most calls uh, that day for that party, which I'm no longer a member of. <laughs> There's a, a lot of reasons for that which we won't go into, but the reason I ran was um, at the time marijuana had just become legalized recreationally and uh, the thought was from the previous select board member who was leaving office that uh, this would be a boom to the tax rolls. And in fact, we've seen it in this many articles that, that uh, th this state and others are making billions and billions of dollars. Using that green money, uh, and cannabis is, is a green product, I mean, there are some things that are wrong with it, like when you break it down with ethanols and, and methanes and butanes and that sort of thing. It's bad for the environment. And, but the, the green crop, the agricultural crop, and hemp can be useful too. Now that that took uh, hold in the 2018 Farm Bill, that's federal, that's 50 states, and all, all states agriculturally can grow hemp, which is 0.3% or less of THC. Anyways, I digress, but I, I did get elected. I, I've been my uh, two terms now, I was reelected without any uh, challengers. I'm finishing out my second term in 14 days from today, so I am running for uh, planning board this time around, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've got a, a new trail bill in town, uh, two EV parking spaces, which have four chargers, and uh, I've got plastic bags banned in the town, all in, all in the two terms I've been in office. And, uh, yeah, thank you. We're going to have a wind turbine before too long. We have municipal fiber that's owned by the town. So. Yeah. Great things are happening in Beckett. I, I did run for state rep against the 20-year incumbent as well. and I got my name out there. It was a one-on-one -on -one race, but the Berkshire Eagle asked me why I was a spoiler. And, you know, <laughs> how could I be a spoiler when there's only two of us? And they, just, they just don't get it, folks. But, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I will again. My name is David Barkley, and as I said before, um, I ran for state rep in Boston, um, and I didn't do too much thinking because Nonchuck told me that I was going to run, <laughs> and I just did what they told me. Um, however, I wanted to plant a seed in that gentleman sitting in Frank Brawl from Holyoke, who works for housing. Um, you should really, you should really consider running. Um, the work that you've been doing has been great, and uh, you have already a base to work from, so we need you to step up. Um, as well as people who think that they're too old. As, here's one, I'm 71 years old, I'm thinking Ooh. mommy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm thinking mommy right before I, I, I venture out. Uh, I would do the same thing again, but it would have to be for a reason. The reason that I had be, I ran was because my jurisdiction was gen gerrymandered by Federer. So I had a reason. I, I carried a message. It wasn't about me. It was 
about each person in that district that was going to lose it. I had motivation and fire to tell them, you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna be given a representative. You, you may not, I want you to sign this so that you have a choice. So that was my motivation. At this time in my life, my motivation is to do exactly what I just did. <laughs> So I think we have time for one more open-ended question and hear from all these candidates and then we're going to thank them and we'll be closer to being on track with our schedule for the day. So my other prompt that I want to invite you each to comment on, and Michael already jumped the gun a little bit on this, but uh, it's okay. I want you to share with the audience the single most positive experience that you took away from running for office. And it could be how you fulfilled some of the 10 key values in your public service, or it could be how you grew as a person by reaching out and talking to all the rest of the members of your community. Uh, but I, I want you to each give a, a little bit of reflection on what did you take away that was a really positive experience for you? The most profound experience that I had, which I think is the reason that I'm here today doing everything that I am doing, was when I was at Stop and Shop collecting signatures and Mel King, who was not that well limping, came up and helped me get signatures. Maybe rest in peace, Mel King. Yeah. Um, I had to give a little bit of the positive values and uh, experience that I had as a candidate. In the latest go-round, when I ran for state rep uh, in Western Mass in the Berkshires, uh, I think it was eye-opening to meet folks in other towns and just tell them about the Green Rainbow Party and what we stand for, and that it's not this evil thing that's trying to disrupt Hillary Clinton's campaign or something. <laughs> and, uh, what we what we are doing for labor and for the people and, and you know reproductive rights and the things that are being taken away from folks uh, nowadays in, in largely out of their states but you know it could happen here too right so we got to keep up the good fight um, and I just really enjoy exposing my politics to other folks outside of my little town in, in the Berkshires so I think it's uh, it's going to be what we have to all do and get ready because you're sitting in the seats here. You're, you're here today. You got to run for office too, uh, and we got to put ourselves out there. Thank you. This is one of those questions I wish I had time to think about. Um, I my story is very small in a certain. Um, it was when I was out collecting signatures to get on the ballot, and um, I, I got buttonholed by a uh, man. This, now there's a tr tradition out in the small towns that you collect signatures at the transfer station. We didn't have trans transfer stations where I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> so this was quite an eye opener. So this guy buttonholed me while I was trying to collect signatures and talked at me for like 15 minutes. He was 180 degrees opposite me politically, but I listened, you know, I couldn't figure out how to cut him off, partly. But um, the funny thing wasn't, didn't happen that day. The wonderful thing happened maybe a week or two late, later when I went back to collect signatures to the same Bolton transfer station. And a, a man came up to me with his maybe eight-year-old son, and he said, I saw you with that man the other week. And I was so impressed. I could tell he was not, you know, your constituent. But I was so impressed that you were respectful and you listened. And he was, he had his son right there and was like, this is what it means.
to be a public servant, to be the kind of person who you would want to vote for. Yeah. Um, my, actually, my experience was kind of similar to that, actually. It was going through, not a specific, it wasn't a specific like, collection of signatures, but it was going through the time and, and seeing how it was actually fairly easy to find common ground um, with people that, at the time, the Tea Party was still strong. And they were, you know, it was all rhetoric about how divisive all, all this stuff was. But if you really looked at it, the people in the Tea Party that were in our town um, often had similar issues, even though they didn't necessarily come to it from the same perspective. And if we could talk about it, I think the biggest thing was that we could generally come to some sort of agreement, at least at the local level, of how to address some of these things in ways that maybe at the national level it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked, but it locally does. Because you don't need to play the political game like that in your communities. I think that's, I think that's a really important thing. Um, and I thought it was also um, nice to have an opportunity to bring up some of the issues, and, and I, I hope that I brought, that some of the other counselors um, had a chance to think about some of the things like, I know this is kind of wonky from a local perspective, but there's this issue called OPEP because it's all of our towns. And it is something that has always driven me crazy. Because I think we already pay the retirement funds every year, and yet Wall Street is forcing us to put millions aside for 30 or 40 years, we cannot afford to do that. We need the money to do things, you know, like roads and stuff now. We can't afford to do that kind of stuff. And I'm so tired of seeing the way the, the Wall Street type things have worked their, we have weaseled their way into local government and are, <clears throat> and we need to figure out some way to get rid of these people. Yeah. <laughs> this game is going to be So thanks again, Gus, Charlene, Michael, David. You are people who have stepped forward. You're not the only people who have stepped forward to reach out to our fellow voters in our communities and make a difference. But you all have, and you've done wonderful things. And I find your examples inspiring. Thank you.